afternoon. Welcome. It's a, it's a tribute, I think, to, uh, to our speakers today that uh, we get this kind of a crowd on a Friday afternoon. So it's good to, good to see you all. Welcome to the Institute uh, of Politics. Um, I said, uh, I just did a podcast with, uh, with JD, and I said that timing in life is everything. Uh, he, wrote his, uh, he wrote his memoir uh, of growing up uh, in and around Appalachia and in white working class uh, America uh, at a propitious time. Uh, and, and in his beautifully written memoir, uh, he gave us some sense of uh, an America that frankly too many in this room probably don't see. Uh, and uh, gave us some insight into the great divide that we have uh, in our country and what the implications of that uh, are. So it's really a, a pleasure to have him here today and uh, important uh, for us to have him here today. And I will leave the rest to our introducer uh, to, uh, to speak to. And we're grateful to have our own, uh, Chicago's own Alex Kotlowitz, uh, distinguished author in his own right, to. Uh, to conduct this uh, discussion. I just want to uh, mention that next week, as part of our ongoing series, America in the Trump Era, uh, our visiting fellow Jackie Combs, uh, late of the New York Times, will lead discussions on the future of trade with former uh, US trade rep uh, Michael Froman and Josh Bivens, uh, and the future of health care uh, with uh, Governor and former HHS Secretary Mike Levitt, as well as Nancy Ann DeParle, who was the pre uh, President Obama's uh, aide in uh, uh, developing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so uh, I heartily recommend that you uh, visit those events because I think they're going to shed light on a couple of issues that are going to be front and center uh, in the years to come. So with that, let me uh, introduce Andrew Mamo, a second year student from Catona. New York, who's majoring in public policy and is one of our uh, great IOP interns. Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Axelrod. J.D. Vance grew up in two places, Middletown, Ohio, and Jackson, Kentucky. In a Rust Belt industrial city and an Appalachian hill town, he and three generations of his family witnessed firsthand the rise and fall of the American dream. He left Middletown after graduating high school to serve in the Marine Corps, graduated from Ohio State in less than two years, and received a law degree from Yale. His New York Times bestselling book, Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir, is truly a book about family, culture, what it looks like to rise up in America, and who gets left behind. He writes about his family with warmth and honesty, digging deep into the culture, values, and morality that makes up America's working poor. The stories Mr. Vance tells, from tales of hillbilly justice to Marine Corps book boot camp, show us what patriotism looks like in so much of modern America. Though not a book strictly about politics, his memoir provides an incredible window into the part of America that has come under such focus after the recent election. With the changing tides happening in American culture, this book will, for years to come, continue to serve as a reflection of the most intimate feelings of those who felt be left behind during the Obama years. The lesson, Mr. Vance asks his reader, Powerful people sometimes do things to help people like me without really understanding people like me. Leading today's discussion will be journalist and national best-selling author Alex Kotlowitz. His Chicago-centered biography, There Are No Children Here, hits on many of the same themes as Hillbilly Elegy, chronicling childhood in the Midwest under troubled parents and economic hardships. Please join me in welcoming Alex Kotlowitz and J.D. Vance. Thanks. This is a testament to not only Chicago, but to Hyde Park, that we get this kind of audience at 12 <laughs> noon. Um, so it's a privilege to be here with uh, J.D. Vance. Um, and if you haven't read his book, it's just, it's a really, one of the things I really admire about the work is that it's, it's so deeply honest and yet incredibly tender and empathic, um, which is not always easy to, to pull off. Um, 
And so I thought what I would want to do with this conversation, we'll work our way to the present, because um, there's clearly a lot to talk about. Um, but I want to start really with the book. And I, I want to ask JD, you know, why did you write the book? And, and I ask that not to be prickly, but really to sort of, you know, <laughs> did you write it to sort of understand, to try to make sense of your own story? Or was it for, because you had an argument you wanted to make? Yeah. Sure. It was a little bit of both. I, I, I started to write the book when I was a, a law student at Yale, and I was really troubled by this feeling that I was some sort of cultural outsider, a bit of a, a foreign alien in this institution. And it struck me that a corollary of, or you know, a corollary of that feeling of being an outsider is that there weren't a lot of kids who grew up like I did who were in those institutions that are obviously gatekeepers to a lot of the opportunities that exist in our society. So I wanted to think about upward mobility in the United States in a very broad sense, but also try to tie it to my personal experiences. And so in that sense, I was trying to make uh, both a broader argument, but really just trying to work through in a lot of ways, some of the things that had happened to me and some of the things that I was, I was really concerned about and didn't quite understand about my family or my community. I'm, I'm curious just on a personal level, did you go back to Middletown and talk to family while you were working on the book? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I mean, for a couple reasons. So one, I just wanted it to be as, as honest and as accurate as possible. And so I didn't just want my memories to be informing this thing. I, I wanted, you know, my family to have their say. And um, I, I also was a little bit worried that if I just wrote this book purely about them, conjured from my own memory, <laughs> that they'd get pretty upset and they'd be upset that somebody had aired the family laundry without consulting them. But the, the fact that they were consulted, the fact that they looked at the manuscripts, the fact that I really sort of interviewed them, and, and you know, I'm not a journalist, but I tried to be a bit of a journalist in interviewing friends and family, um, helped a lot and I think definitely made the book a little bit better. And what was their response to what they read? Well, be, because they were expecting it, I, I, their response was just happiness for me, for the success of the book, and so forth. But there was definitely a little bit of pushback, a little bit of worry that I was airing the family's dirty laundry and that folks were worried it would paint us in a negative light. Um, but, you know, mo 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 right. most, mo most of them, I think, once they saw the, the, the finished book and once they recognized I think, how important it was to me, they just appreciated it for what it was. Right. Well, I think one of the things you did really well in the book is, despite the fact that people obviously will make some make some bad choices along the way, is you come to sort of on some level understand sort of how they get to that place. Um, so, which brings me to sort of the core of the book. I mean, I think the sort of central argument, if I understand it right, is this notion that so much of the reason that people are poor um, has to do with, with choices, with behavior, with culture. Um, can you speak to that a bit? Because um, I sense a little bit in the book that you're kind of a little torn about this argument. That well, I, I am really torn about it. And I think that the, the, the reasons that people are, are poor is very complicated, right? So there's the sort of structural argument and a cultural argument. And I think both arguments have elements of truth and, and, and important, important things to say. I'm actually a little bit agnostic about this, this more difficult question, especially in my community, of why people got poor in the first place. Right? So I, I, don't, I don't try to sort of analyze the very rich history of how the Appalachian region became poor in the first place and sort of why maybe that may have spread beyond Appalachia to the broader industrial Midwest. Uh, but, but I do try to answer this question of now that people are poor, now that they do have these, these certain cultural and economic baggages that come along with being poor, why do they stay poor? Why is it so hard for people to, to overcome that stuff? And so I do come to a, a cultural explanation, even though I think the structural argument is also very important and is a critical part of the story. The one interesting thing about culture is you talk about culture and people necessarily assume that you're thinking culture of poverty, look at these people and how pathological they are, and that explains why they're not doing especially well. I think of culture in a way that somebody like William Julius Wilson might use it, which is a little bit more just intuitive to me that when you grow up in a certain environment and you grow up in certain circumstances, it's ridiculous to think that that doesn't leave its trace, that the attitudes and the habits that you see around you don't necessarily inform how you live the rest of your life, even if you're lucky enough to, to achieve some measure of material right. prosperity. Or that it doesn't influence the choices that you make. There's a moment Absolutely. in your book when um, your mom is, who's 
I believe doing heroin at the time and has to, she's a nurse and has to provide a urine test. Um, and so she comes to you, you're, you're I think 12 or 14? You're, you're uh, quite, I think it was 14, 14 or 15, if, yeah. yeah. And she comes to you and asks if you would provide her with urine and you're furious and angry with her, but it turns out too that you're also afraid because you've been smoking pot that you're gonna get busted. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then your grandmother uh, intervenes and tells you to go ahead and provide the urine test. And so all these decisions, all these choices that people make along the way, which are, which on the surface seem like crazy, but yet in the context of everything, you sort of understand why you make those choices. Yeah, absolutely. Mammal told me that I was probably too much of an idiot, so I didn't inhale properly, and so it wouldn't show up <laughs> on on the drug test. And she was right. She was right. Um, mom, mom did pass, but. It, it, yeah, no, it, it, it goes to show that the, the sort of decision matrices that we come up with for how to navigate life's various obstacles, right, they don't exist in a vacuum. People right. aren't hyper-rational in this sort of abstract way. They, 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 their life experiences inform how they right. think about things, how they weigh different, different options. And, you know, what, what's interesting about that, if you think about that, that moment in my life, it, it's... It sort of created an almost anti-institutional bias in the way that I felt. I don't talk about this so much in the book, but the, the fact that I, I effectively had to decide between my mom or between these sort of supervisory institutions, and that choice necessarily creates, I think, uh, incentives and pressures to make other choices later on. Right. So, and, I, and, and as someone who definitely has a bit of an, like an anti-establishmentarian mindset, I wonder if the way that we approached some of these questions actually in, informs that. Right, it's funny, I always, I, mean, I, I, I think a lot about sort of my reporting on the, you know, the south side and west side of Chicago, for instance, and just a, kind of as an example, you know, sort of if, if a young man there is sort of seeking vengeance because of a shooting, and on the surface it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but then you sort of come to understand, well, the police have been really unable to solve crimes, and so there's no sense of justice, and this, fear that if they're brought into this, that they're gonna somehow be held culpable. And so people sort of take matters yep. into their own hand. And I'm not excusing it, but what you do so beautifully in your book is trying to understand those choices that on the surface seem so wrong-headed. Yeah. Uh, well, in your pride, you know, I think of that, and I, and I think your pride when you grow up in a certain environment is the only thing that you really have control over, mm -hmm. right? It's like your sense of identity, your reputation, that's the one thing that you can really right. control. And of course, that doesn't necessarily lead to hyper-rational productive decisions, but you sort of understand it when you, you think about how they got to that, that point in the first place. Right, right, and I also think we have a really hard time in this country holding together in the same hand this notion of personal responsibility alongside collective responsibility. You know, that for conservatives, it's so easy, it's all about behavior and choices, it's all about the personal decisions you make, and for liberals, it's all about the structural, but the truth of the matter is that it's, it's complicated. I mean, they're so, as you suggest, so intertwined. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're often so ideologically um, separated on these questions that it's sometimes very hard to even have the conversation and acknowledge that the other side has something to say, right? So a lot of the positive conservative reviews of my book completely set aside some of the economic arguments that I make. Right. And um, a lot of the, 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 the positive left of center reviews of the book very often just talk about, look at these various problems that are going on in this community, and they don't necessarily take the personal responsibility right. side especially right. seriously, which is always a sort of worry that I have when you write a book and you argue that things are just complicated. Does it allow somebody to read it and just confirm their own biases right. as opposed to be challenged by it? And your grandmother was kind of like this, this, she was kind of the metaphor for that because on the one hand she's telling you to, you know, God damn it, make these right choices. And on the <laughs> other hand she's telling you, but you got to know JD, life isn't fair. Right. You know, she's, so, and she managed to hold both of those in the same, same hand. Yeah, she did. And it was very important to recognize that life was unfair. It gave me a certain perspective when I encountered certain things. and and made me appreciate that it wasn't all my fault, right? I, I sort of could look at the world and be okay with the fact that there were barriers for us that didn't necessarily exist for everybody else. But at the same time, she tried to instill in me this really robust sense of personal agency. Don't sell yourself short. Don't think you don't have any control because it, it is ultimately very self-destructive, right? And this is one of the, the, the interesting studies that I came across when I was writing the book. 
is about addiction and sort of the psychology and the biology of addiction, right? And so we, we tend to understand, neuroscientists tend to understand addiction as having a fundamentally biological component to it, right? It's maybe not right to call it quite a disease, different people disagree, but there's certainly something going on in people's brains that make them more predisposed to addiction um, than, than, than other people. But at the same time, what's interesting is, is, is you know, some evidence suggests that when the individual addict believes that their addiction is a disease, they're less likely to fight against it and less likely to overcome it. And there's this certain sense of self-defeatism that if you see a problem as purely outside of your control, then it can become pretty self-destructive. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've got to say that in reading your book, I mean, it, it, so much of it f resonated with my reporting on, again, on the communities here on the west and south side. I mean, the sort of, the kind of pessimism that you talk about, the kind of ho ho hopelessness, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of f families that begin to crack under all the pressures around them, um, the presence of drugs and alcohol and addiction and even the violence. I mean, your grandmother, you know, she, she had her share of guns. So. <laughs> <laughs> she may not have used them, yeah. uh, but she threatened to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, when she died, we found, I think, 19 handguns <laughs> in her house. And they were, all, they were all loaded. And she was very hobbled at that point. It was very hard for her to move around. But we, we found them in like various strategic parts of the house so that if an intruder came in, even though she moved at like the speed of tortoise, she could have a gun within arm's reach. Right. Right. And if you haven't read the book, you've got to understand that his grandmother was kind of really your, what saved you. In yeah, the end. I mean, she's the one who, given all her, uh, uh, um, her kind of uh, internal contradictions, she's the one who kind of knew what you were capable of and what was what you faced out there. Yeah, that's absolutely right. She was this really powerful woman. That's the only word that I can use to describe her. She didn't graduate from high school, but she was incredibly smart, incredibly witty, was very willing to at least threaten violence on behalf of her, herself and her family. I mean, I, I remember when she found out that I was hanging out with one of the bad kids in the neighborhood, right? One of the kids who was starting to experiment with drugs. She just said, like, very frankly, sort of in this menacing whisper, if you continue to hang out with this kid, I will run him over with my car, and no one will ever find out. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and, and of course, that was very good for me because I stopped hanging out with this kid and, um, you know, stopped, sort of got away from that bad influence. I don't think she would have ever actually ran over a small child with a car, at least I hope not. But... The, the fact that I thought that she would, right? The, the, the fact that I even entertained the possibility you know, she was sort of this wild card was really important and it made me listen to her when she threatened things like that, which is ultimately in my benefit. Well, let me ask, I mean, one of the, before we move on to the conversation about Trump, but I, I, a couple of questions. One, you know, at the center of your book is this notion, this kind of recognition of the importance of family. I mean, it is ultimately, I think, the most important institution out there. I don't think there's anybody who would disagree with that. I think where it gets, where we begin to have an argument and debate is how do you, in the end, fortify family? I mean, it's the issue in places like, again, like the south side of Chicago. And so I wonder whether you've thought about that at all, about how we sort of find ways to strengthen and fortify family, given how absolutely essential it is. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've thought a lot about it, and this is one of the areas where it's hard to think of an obvious policy intervention or nonprofit intervention that's really going to help. I mean, th there certainly are things that are going to help on the margin, but there obviously isn't a magic bullet that we found for how to stabilize some of these, these more chaotic families, because if we had found it, we would already be doing it. I, I do think that one of the blind spots that exists in, in policymakers is a, a sort of preoccupation <coughs> with the nuclear family as the most important unit. And very often, we don't think of the extended family as, as also a very important unit. And so, you know, my grandparents, my aunt, my uncle, all of these people played really stabilizing forces in my life. But I, I remember, and I talk about this obviously in the book, that the first time that I ever, and the only time I ever went into the sort of child welfare services system, I was given an option, and not from a, a person who was menacing and malevolent, but the, the caseworker basically said, J.D., if you keep on talking, if you keep on talking about all the things that are going on in your, in your home, I've got to remove you from the home. Not put you with your grandma or with your aunt or uncle, but I've got to put you with a licensed foster care agent. Yeah. 
And, and so I, I think that that reveals a certain bias for institutionalized foster families as an alternative to the nuclear family. But there's a lot of good evidence that suggests that the extended family is an especially important uh, bulwark when the, the traditional nuclear family destabilizes. And th there, there's obviously an important cultural element to, to this too, right? I mean, this is something that <coughs> I've talked a lot about with, um, you know, with, with a lot of black folks who've read the book, where the, the, the extended family, this idea of the big matriarch who sits over the superstructure is something that's very natural to me coming from an Appalachian family, but it's also something that I've heard a lot from, from, from black folks who also feel like their, their family superstructure is very similar. Right, no, I think you're right. And I think the real, so the real question is sort of from a public policy standpoint is, is what do you do? And I think you're right, there's a lot to do along the margins. I mean, obviously the provision of work and you know, sort of providing adequate housing, all the things that we kind of know, but again, it, it all comes back to this notion that somehow we've got to figure out a way to create a strong family. And I think whatever, most of the public policy efforts I think have been pretty clumsy. I mean, I think of you know, Bush's efforts, for example, to get poor people married, right. um, this uh, kind of short-lived effort right before 9-11. Um, but it was, it was kind of ludicrous to think that somehow the idea that the government could play Cupid and, or that the idea that actually a two-parent family was necessarily inherently better than a single-parent family. Uh, that was where Match.com came from. It was the government's effort to build a, a matching database. No, I mean, I, so, so I'm, I agree with you, and I'm, I'm definitely cynical about these things. But I, I do think that you know, on this point of thinking of the extended family as a useful unit, as a bulwark, I mean, maybe we can't stabilize every marriage, but can we make it so that the, the effects of a, of a marriage that's gone south or a relationship that's gone south doesn't affect the children mm -hmm. of that union right. quite, quite as much? And I think the answer is yes. And there, there are a couple of things I suggest in the book. You know, one, legally make it easier, and some states are better on this than others, but legally make it easier for the child of a broken home to go and live with an extended family member so that they don't have to sever all bonds of familial relationship, but also financially make it easier, right? This is something that's a big problem in Ohio, especially with the opioid epidemic, is you have all these grandparents who are doing okay on Social Security, but all of a sudden, mom goes to jail because of an overdose, dad dies because, because of an overdose, and the children are living with the grandparents sometimes outside of like the superstructure of the child welfare system that you know isn't necessarily a legal regime and the grandparents are plunged into poverty because of it right because they can't support four children on an income that was designed to support two elderly folks so i i, I do actually think that this is one area where, the, where policy levers where could, could be somewhat successful but you're right, it's not gonna repair necessarily the family chaos that's there right now. It just may prevent some of the negative consequences from really enduring. Great, so let's, trans as, as David said, this, the book came out at a propitious moment um, and you became kind of the <laughs> Trump whisperer, right? To help uh, <laughs> help us understand sort of what was, what was at work. Um, um, <laughs> so let me, let me ask, I mean, before the election, obviously everybody sort of turned to you and said, oh my God, here we've got a guy who can explain this to us, what's going on, and explain this support. So maybe, I mean, I know the answer to this, but maybe it'd be helpful, I think, to sort of begin here is to sort of help us understand sort of that, why that support of Trump? What was at work there? Um, yeah, so, so I was talking with uh, David about this earlier, but there are a couple of things that really come to mind for why folks were so willing to support Trump. So the first is we, we talk about economic anxiety and, and, and we sort of have this debate about how much it's driving the Trump phenomenon. But the sense that I always got is that the folks who were most likely to support Trump were those whose lives were going <coughs> south in a lot of other different, maybe hard, to, you know, difficult to quantify measures. Right, so it's not just that jobs are hard to find, that that's important, it's that you walk down Main Street and there isn't a single operating business, it's just a bunch of empty, empty stuff. Uh, people are dying of drug overdoses at a rate that they haven't died in your community ever. It's something that you've never really seen before. Um, families are breaking apart. More and more people are going to jail, and that's one of the things we see is the incarceration rates going down. Lifetime you know, mor mortality rates are actually going in the wrong direction. So, all of these things create this general sense of decline and people are incredibly frustrated at it. 
and they're looking for an answer that's different than whatever they've been offered in the past. And I think this is one of the reasons why you have this group that has swung from one pendulum to the other in our electoral system. And a lot of the people who voted for Obama in 08 voted for Trump in 2016, and I suspect it's, they're going to be a, a relatively unstable politically for, for, the long, for the long haul because a lot of these problems are going to take really um, long and, and right. long-term efforts to fix. Can I stop you here for a moment? Yeah, yeah. Just to, so, I mean, you make, I think, a really important point that many of these people voted for Obama and now and then voted for Trump, which seems on the surface kind of like, how do you get your head around that? But I wonder whether part of it is that for Obama, and you talked about this in a recent piece you did for the Times, but whether they saw, I mean, outside of the issue of race, whether they saw some of themselves in Obama. I mean, here's a guy who grew up, you know, single parent home, struggled, um, you know, found his way. Uh, uh, this, this, he kind of broke the myth of social mobility. And I so I wonder whether they saw some of themselves in Obama and saw something very different in Trump, obviously. But, but I, but I just I wonder what it is that they saw in each of them that brought them to support an Obama and then to support a Trump. Well, a, a big part of Trump's appeal on this question is that in, in style and tone, he was a massive middle finger to the entire elite system that people feel like has screwed them, right? I mean, he's the guy who criticizes as sort of a firebrand, and, and he really says things to America's so-called coastal elites that they wish they could say themselves. So I, I think that, that, that you can't disconnect the fact that Trump was a very successful candidate at a time when people were very cynical, they're frustrated because they're cynical, and they're angry because they're frustrated, and Trump really channeled that rage in a certain way. I, I don't know, I, I'm sure that, the, that there's definitely an element of people seeing themselves in President Obama. Um, certainly he's, he's an admirable person, you look at his personal story, but I also actually think that there's something a little bit really difficult about President Obama in, in terms of being able to connect with it. Right? I mean, everything from the way that he speaks, the, the uniform that he, that he wears to work, the fact that he very clearly is just made for this moment in American history, right? He's, he's this guy who all of his skills, intelligence, education, eloquence, on and on and on, seem made for this particular moment at a time when a lot of people don't feel like their particular skill set or the things that society values necessarily apply to them. So I, I don't know that a lot of people felt really personally connected to President Obama as much as they just felt like, here's a guy who's promising change and clearly we need to change. Right. And you were going to mention the other thing about Trump. You were, or was it the fact that he was giving the middle finger to Yeah, everybody? there's a style yeah, and tone yeah, element yeah. to Trump, right? Yeah. There's also something that despite the fact that he's a millionaire, and somebody once said that you know, Trump, or Trump is a billionaire, he obviously doesn't live a life that a lot of these people can really understand or appreciate, but he's a billionaire in a way that's much more relatable, right? So people compare Trump's apartment and Trump Tower to like Elvis Presley's house in Graceland, right? With the gold-plated toilets and the really ostentatious displays of wealth. And they say, this is what a person who isn't wealthy acts like if they have a lot of money. And there, there, there's, there's something to that, I think. And, and, and there's, there's the related point just in terms of the way that he communicates, right? He's much more relatable in the way that he speaks than politicians of either party have been for a very long time. And so at what point does Trump begin to sort of, does that base begin to crack for him now? Or does it? I mean, do people, do you think people are paying attention to sort of these first, I mean, these first 14 days or 13 days have been so chaotic and um, uh, in some ways, as, as David said earlier, somewhat dangerous. And, sure. and uh, at what point do people sort of begin to think, boy, I wonder if this is really in our best interest. Sure. Yeah. Well, my, my guess, and this is a really hard question to answer because it's so complicated, right? My, my guess is that people are going to give him a pretty long leash, that the, the time scale for whether folks will start to abandon Trump is in years as opposed to weeks and months. And so a lot of people, they're not paying as close attention to the day-to-day -day news cycle. A lot of the things that are obviously animating those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about politics are not necessarily on their radar. And my guess is that if, if, he, if his support, if his core base really starts to crack, then that's going to be something we see two, three years from now as opposed to 
um, a couple of months from now. The, 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 the related point here, which is why it makes it so hard to predict this, is that a lot of this depends on the opposition, right? So there were a lot of people I knew, even people who didn't vote for President Obama, who just did not like Donald Trump. They didn't like his rhetoric. They didn't like something about his, his personality. And they voted for him anyway because they felt like Hillary Clinton was such an unacceptable choice for a variety of different reasons. And so you can imagine a situation where Trump's base really has started to fall apart, but where he's still able to win a presidential election in four years because the alternative may still be unpalatable to a lot of people. Well, we'll, we'll see if we get that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious if you've been back to Middletown since the book has come out. If, uh, and I guess I'm wondering if you've had this conversation with people in Middletown about Trump or, um, or is it really that they just want to talk about the book? And, uh... <laughs> well, people are definitely more interested in talking about the book and about me personally. I, I go back to Middletown all the time, so, so definitely have been back since the book came out. You know, I, I try to, partially because I'm on TV all the time talking about the Trump voter, I try to really get a sense of what other people are thinking so I don't end up in the trap of substituting what I think for what is the white working class or what is middle America thinking right now. So, so I, I do, you know, sort of start pol conversations about politics just so I can have some of those discussions. But get, you know, the sense that I've gotten this early in is that, is that folks just don't know what the big, the big fuss is. Right? You know, the, the, the last time I really had a serious conversation with somebody about Trump was in the wake of the crowd size debate right after the inauguration. And the sense that I got was, why are we talking about this? That's what we all wanted to right. know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but, but, you know, and I, and I think that it, it, you know, to them, why are we talking about this reflects poorly, definitely on the president, but also reflects poorly on the media. And there was this sort of dual sense that neither one of these guys is really getting this conversation right. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of the questions that, you know, certainly those in my profession have is sort of how do you find a way to... You know, I mean, I think journalism, I mean, in the, I, I'm saying the obvious, but it's so essential to the sort of foundation of any democracy, and it's going to be especially essential now, but how do you get beyond sort of this echo chamber that we're in, and how do you find a way to provide news to people in places like Middletown, uh, news that they feel they can trust? And that's, that's a really tough one. Um, because I think that part of what's going on, too, is this sense of misinformation um, uh, that is so difficult to overcome in light of that. Yeah, I, I really worry about this. And unfortunately, I don't necessarily think there's an easy answer to this. I certainly don't have it, right? Part of it is just, it's a symptom of the broader geographic segregation that we have in our country, right? So you live in Middletown, Ohio. You don't know anybody, anybody who works at a, a mainstream media brand. You don't interact with the mainstream media a whole lot. Even your local newspaper, if it exists at all, is really struggling. So there, there's a sense in which the fact that the people don't trust the mainstream media is a symptom of some of these much broader cultural problems that we have, and the fact that they just feel disconnected from that entire grouping, whether they're working in finance or media right. or politics or whatever. And part of the problem is definitely just the 24-hour news, news cycle, to be critical of the media for a second, has, has not been especially helpful to the credibility of, of a lot of these reporters, right? And the reporters haven't done themselves a lot of favors. We were just talking about this earlier. It seems like every single day there's a story. It's typically a small story. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, but it explodes on Twitter for two or three hours. And then, you know, half a day later, whoever originated the story has to say, oh, no, it actually wasn't that right. bad. This wasn't that right. true. And that constant cycle, even if it's relatively unimportant stuff, where here's a fact, here's a partial retraction of the fact, really destroys the credibility right. of these institutions. And, right, and making it worse. I mean, the best example of that is the, the report initially that you know, Trump had removed Martin Luther King's bust, a right. really small, minor thing, and quickly they retracted that story. But my God, Trump kept that story alive for Absolutely. two or three days to just sort of, again, talk about the fake media. But I mean, you talk about in your book about this other part of this equation, which is that in communities of deep pessimism and decay, that how easy it is to have to, for conspiracy theories to grow. Right. Um, and you've talked about that in the, among the people that you grew up with. That's, uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's a significant problem I write about in the book, and it was one of the things that was more politically prescient. Obviously, the book isn't hyper-political, but that section was because I was talking about fake news before you know, most, most folks were talking about fake news. I just wasn't calling it that. But I, I do see it as, as symptomatic of some of these broader issues in like mainstream credibility and cultural segregation as, as opposed necessarily to a cause of, of some of the social mistrust, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 somebody asked me not too long ago about some conspiracy related to the president, President Obama, and was trying to interpret something the president had done in light of the fact that maybe he's this subversive foreign agent. And they, they were you know, asking me this question in a very honest way, you know, what do you think about this? And I said, actually, I, I don't believe, I may not agree with the policy, but I don't believe this guy's a bad guy. I know people who work for him. I was you know, lucky enough to meet him once, and I just don't believe the worst things that you're hearing. And the response was, oh, that's really good to hear. He seems like a good guy. Um, and it, it just goes to show that actually knowing people who are sort of in these social networks makes people more willing to trust them and have faith in them, right? right. But if you don't know a single person who's working in the media, it's really easy to believe the conspiracy theories because why would you trust somebody you don't know over somebody you don't know, right? right. It's, it's just a free-for-all at that point. Right. And it's one, I think, one of the great paradoxes of our country is this notion that we're kind of all in this together, and yet I think we lead such disconnected lives. You know, I mean, obviously Middletown, incredibly isolated, disconnected from those of us here in Chicago, but even here in our own city, I mean, where we live in a place like Hyde Park on the north side, so incredibly disconnected from places like Englewood or a North Lawndale. Um, and so it leads to these kind of myths that, you know, grow and take on lives of their own. And, and without any contact, it's hard to dispel those myths. Yeah. And it's easier to live in a place where you don't have much contact, right? I mean, right. the main source that I get, the main source of information and news in my life right now, despite the fact that I think it's terrible for my health, is Twitter, right? <laughs> but Twitter is in its own way a sort of self-selecting universe where you follow the people that you want to follow. And unless you're really diligent about getting sources of information from folks who may not agree with you, it's super easy and probably easier than it's ever been to cloister yourself in your own little information network. So let me ask, I, I take it you're not a Trump supporter from what I've read, am I right? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. yeah. But so, um, so where, it, what do we do now? Um, I mean, I guess what, you know, how do you talk to people in Middletown about Trump? What do you say to them to um, convince them that perhaps it's time to sort of take a stand or, or do you not even have that conversation yet? I think it's way too early to have that conversation just because people are still in some ways recovering from the 24-hour news cycle of the election and are, are taking time off in some ways, right? People just aren't paying as close attention to a lot of the stuff that we think. And th this, this implicates something I said earlier, though, that there's this question of the alternative, right? I didn't vote for Trump. I am hopeful, like I think most Americans, that he'll be successful because his success is now the country's success. But I didn't vote for Hillary either. And so there's this, this issue where even for me, as, as problematic as I saw a lot of Trump's rhetoric and his, his ideas on how to fix some of these problems, I agreed with him that the problems were there, but it was just really hard for me to vote for Hillary Clinton. And that, that goes to show that in our oppositional two-party system, that unless you have somebody else to vote for, then people are going to accept a lot of bad stuff from their candidate right up to the point that they're not going to anymore, right? And so I heard that a lot from, from Trump voters, like, you know, how can you like what he said about this group of people, or how can you think that he's really going to solve our problems? And very often the response that I got was, I don't, and I'm not going to vote for Hillary. Right. And where do you think race played into all this? Because I think the sort of myth is that, you know, all these Trump supporters are vehement racists and... Uh, anti-immigrant, and so where do you think it, it played? Yeah. Well, you know, race, race definitely played a role in, in the 2016 election. I think that race will always play a role in our country. It's just sort of a constant fact of American life. And, and definitely some people who voted for Trump were racist, and they voted for him for racist reasons. I always resist the idea that the real thing driving most Trump voters was racial anxiety or, or, or racial animus. 
partially because I, I didn't see it, right? I mean, the thing that really motivated people to vote for Trump, first in the primary and then in the general election, was three words, jobs, 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 right? And it's very easy to, 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 to get back to this point about information bubbles. It's very easy for somebody like me to watch the sources of news that I watch and to only see the really offensive stuff that Trump did replayed over and over again. But if you go to one of his rallies, it's maybe 5% him being really outrageous and offensive and 95% him talking about, here are all the things that are wrong in your community, here's why they're wrong, and I'm gonna bring back jobs. That was the core thesis of Trump's entire argument. And so it's just, it strikes me as, as a little bizarre to chalk, chalk it up to sort of racial animus because one, the country is less racist now than it was 15 years ago and we weren't electing uh, Donald Trump 15 years ago. And, and two, that's just not, that wasn't the core part of his message and that wasn't what a lot of his voters were really connecting with. And the final point that I'll make on this is that the, 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 the political dialogue in 2016 was in 2015 was obviously hyper-racialized, right? There was, there was all these alt-right people, and I'm in an interracial marriage, and I got a lot of stuff directed at me and my wife on, on online message boards and Twitter and so forth. So I definitely buy that this was a racialized discourse unlike any that we've had in a really long time, but I don't blame Trump's voters for that. The people that I blame for that are actually typically well-educated coastal elitists, people like Richard Spencer and the alt-right, it's telling that the alt-right is driven by primarily very well-educated, relatively smart, relatively stable people. It's not driven by people in the Rust Belt who go on 4chan and talk about Michelle Obama in these really nasty ways, right? It's 2,500, I mean, whatever the number of people is, I've heard estimates up to like 100,000, but these are people who are really well-educated and are cognitive elites in their own weird way. Right, like Steve Bannon. Yeah, that's, right. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know how well educated he is, but he's <laughs> um, he's, he's very well educated. Yeah, no, I know. I, I, I'm, uh, but you know, it's interesting though. I do th I do wonder though whether you know this this notion of jobs, jobs, jobs. I mean, part of that was also finding scapegoats. I mean, I think it was why all the sort of animus towards immigrants. I mean, that that clearly was part of that equation. Was you know they're coming here, they're taking our jobs. We need to send them back. Yeah. yeah, and and so the the question I have, and I have my own answer, is: Do we think of that? Which direction is that going in? Right? Are people worried about jobs? Consequently, they're worried about immigrants, immigrants either stealing their jobs or depressing wages, or are they worried about immigrants because of some sort of xenophobic or racial reason? And so jobs gives them excuse to worry about these things. My, my sense is that it always goes from jobs to this other to the, to, to, to the immigrants and not in the reverse direction because that, that really is the thing that people seem most concerned about, right? It's, I can't get work, or I can get work, but it's at a much lower wage, or somebody that I know can't get work. It, it's just, it's hard to overstate how ubiquitous of a thought that is when you live in, the, in these communities where steel mills are closing down, coal mines are closing down, and so forth. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think there's an element of, if you see the problem, you get to name it. Right, so the person who saw Haley's comment, I believe his name was Haley, right? And so what Trump saw is that a lot of Republican base voters were really unhappy and that they were dissatisfied with the standard Republican answer to those problems. So if for 15, 20, 30 years, Republicans had been saying, you want more jobs, you want better livelihoods for yourself and your family, what we need to do is, is really get that top marginal tax rate from 35 to 29 or whatever the case may be and we've got to deregulate as much as possible so that the noble businessmen can create jobs. Trump was the first person who realized that narrative had no more real salience with the Republican base, and so he came up with a different narrative. And in some cases, I think his narrative was right. I mean, it, it, I, I do think that trade hasn't necessarily been in the best interests of a lot of these communities. Now, the question of whether you can go backwards in time, I think the answer is no, but he at least was identifying something real. And more importantly, he was identifying something different. Right. And people were fed up with the old explanation. Right. So w w one question before we open up to the audience. So you've moved back to Ohio or been in the process of moving back. With what intent? Are you planning to run for office? Are you going to keep on writing? Are you... Uh, uh, I'm sorry I didn't hear that question. <laughs> to the audience. <laughs> um, no, I... <laughs> well, you're all set now. You're all, you're, you're, <laughs> so... so 
I am, am not planning to run for office, and I'm going to start a small nonprofit that's really focused on this, this opioid crisis that's hit Ohio especially hard, but it's hit a lot of communities hard across the country. And as I was t telling David earlier, I've wanted to move home since I was a little kid, not a little kid, sorry, 2003, when I was a teenager and I left for the Marine Corps, I've been homesick basically since that moment. And so I've always been looking for an opportunity to move back home. And this crazy time is as good a time as any. Cool, cool. Well, it's actually interesting. I mean, one of the things you talk about in your book is the brain drain. You know, the people leaving communities like yeah. Middletown or again, like in Englewood or Lawndale and moving on. And But I think what people don't recognize is the number of people actually who do come back in some ways to uh, sort of rebuild what they know needs strengthening and fortifying. So, sure. uh, good. my hat's off to you. So let's open up to questions, yeah. I think we've got a microphone in the middle right, if, if yeah. people want to ask a question. Hey. Hi. Um, my question is, what mistakes do you think liberal politicians are making in striking up meaningful dialogue with the white working class? <laughs> well, one, I, I, I think that one of the critiques that I agree with about the 2016 election is that it seemed to be focused much more on cultural issues from the left as opposed to economic issues from the left. And a lot of the themes that Donald Trump picked up on were classically left of center arguments about declining wages and declining jobs and so forth. So I, I do agree broadly with the critique that Democrats um, should be talking a little bit more about issues close to home, about economic concerns, and not as much about some of the, the cultural issues that really animate, frankly, the elites of the Democratic Party, but not necessarily the base even of the Democratic Party. That's, that's one answer to that question. The other answer to that question is this inability to cross ideological boundaries in our conversations is to me a symptom of something much bigger and much more important, which is what we talked about earlier, which is you have this massive geographic segregation of opportunity and talent, and that's just reflecting itself in our politics. I think it's really easy for me to sit up here and say Democratic politicians should be more compassionate to Trump voters. I agree with that, but it's really hard to be compassionate with somebody you don't actually know. And so I think that uh, my advice, especially to young Democrats, is to, to, to borrow a line from the Alex McGillis article that came out right after Trump won, go Midwest, young hipster, because if, <laughs> if people continue to live in, you know, if, if this sort of problem of people going and getting an education and setting up shop in these hyper elite areas continues, you're not going to be able to talk to somebody that you, you don't really understand and you don't even know. Right. And I think also there's also this tend to be sort of set in your ideology. And one of the things I really admired about your book is, and I may be wrong about this, is that I, I sense a little bit that you set out in part to make this argument about personal responsibility. And then in sort of exploring the history of your family and the community began to sort of recognize how complex it was. And that, um, and that this issue of, you know, again, personal responsibility and collective responsibility, it's, we've got to be able to talk about them at the at the same time. I meant to write about both, though I, I come, you know, maybe from from the right, and so the personal responsibility stuff was a little bit more, for, right. you know, in, in the front of my mind. But I, I definitely set out trying to harmonize these right. two divergent thoughts right. a, a little bit. But it's it's a it's a fair it's a fair fair comment. Um, I think my my question is kind of a follow-up to that. Um, I'm a Midwesterner, but I've never lived outside a major metropolitan area. Um, and this election, I think, really drove home how disconnected a lot of us are, even in the Midwest, from rural areas. Sure. And so what would be a functional way to just reconnect with these areas, um, not having family or experience there, um, in terms of not political discussions, but just empathy and getting to know people better? My best advice is, there's a, and it's not very good advice, so I apologize, but <laughs> there, there are a lot of civic institutions that are working in rural areas where I suspect no matter what your ideological preferences are, whether you're extremely to the left or extremely to the right, there are civic institutions in rural areas that are really trying to work on those issues, right? Um, so get involved in a church that's maybe a 20 or 30 minute drive from your house. Get involved in a community organization that's working on some of the issues of poverty and inequality that maybe you, you really care about, but you've only seen in a metropolitan context. So I, I think there are a lot of, of ways to get involved, but 
there are just a lot of good groups that are doing a lot of important work out there. And it's amazing that you get involved with them and you just necessarily meet a lot of people who you might not have otherwise met. So that's my, my one piece of bad advice. Hey there. Um, so you talked a, a fair bit about the geographic divide, and that's always been really salient for me. But I, while you suggested the hipster should go <coughs> Midwest, which I follow, I'm <laughs> curious why you wouldn't suggest for the rural areas to instead not go, live there anymore. Sure. So the argument is that the research suggests that technology has made most of those jobs disappear, sure. and the smaller communities are simply less productive, at least relative to a city. Uh, to what extent do you think we as a society should consider making it more urban than it is now? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think that both things should be true and can be true, right? So it can be the case that people who are really talented or have been very fortunate and afforded a lot of opportunities should go back to their communities or should go to communities that need their talents and need their hard work. And also that people who live in really high unemployment areas should be moving typically to urban centers where there's not so much <coughs> unemployment, where there are a lot more economic opportunities. So I think both things should happen simultaneously. There are a lot of real barriers to moving from a place like Eastern Kentucky, even in, in places where the, you know, the, the poverty rate is approaching 50%, and there aren't a whole lot of reasons to stay there, um, but there are real barriers, right? Moving from Eastern Kentucky to San Francisco is really expensive, and more importantly, um, it's really hard to get an affordable house Partially because, not just partially, I think largely because of really ill-advised government policies about land use regulations and zoning and so forth. So it, it's, it's a very important point. It's a, it's a point where policy levers could be really important and really impactful. But so long as we're charging $4,000 for a one-bedroom apartment in New York City or San Francisco, or maybe not as much in Chicago, but still, I think, an, an elevated, elevated amount, you're, you're going to create real disincentives for people to actually move to, to urban centers, to move to places where there are more opportunities. And I, th I think the other issue there, too, um, is that you know, you've, you're, if, if we suggest that the answer to all this is to move, and you have a colleague at National Review who said, just get, get yeah. your U-Haul and, and, and move if things aren't working out for you, is again, this goes back to this notion of family and how important family is. And so if you begin, if that's sort of your fix, uh, you begin to disrupt the very the very institution that's so essential, so important. Yeah, yeah there, there are definitely um, there are definitely drawbacks to the idea that really poor folks, folks living in low unemployment areas, uh, or sorry, low employment areas, should be moving elsewhere. But it, it strikes me that the the alternative, which is what we have now, which is a really ossified mm -hmm. geographical labor market, is just not a not a good good idea. So. There are definitely downsides, but my sense is the positives probably outweigh, um, um, outweigh the downsides, but there are also ways to maybe mitigate some of, some of those family disruption issues. Hi there. Hi. So it seemed that for you very early on, the strongest interventions you had with regard to education were from your grandmother and grandfather. You write about them very fondly, both in terms of setting higher expectations for you and also studying independently outside of school. Sure. Later on in life, you encountered a professor at law school, Amy Chua, no stranger to controversy in her own books. Sure. Um, could you speak to what sort of interventions would have been useful to someone like a young JD outside of having a extended family with individuals strong-willed enough to advance their education on their behalf? That's a really tough question and all answer it rhetorically first and then I'll answer it in a real way second. But you know, one answer that I'd, I'd ask people to think about is given the, the types of interventions that really worked in my life, and I think there's a lot of evidence that those interventions work in a lot of other people's lives, right? I mean, having an adult that a kid, even from a chaotic household, can rely on really builds resilience, it builds grit and so forth. So what are policy levers that we could pull to make a kid's environment look a little bit more like the environment that I grew up in, right? Where you had access to somebody who could be a really helpful mentor, or you had access to somebody who was really going to focus on, um, you know, on, on making your life a little bit better despite all of the, the negative things that are going on around you. So a couple answers that come to mind are, one, we should really be thinking about how to build mentoring relationships between low-income kids and some of the teachers in their lives, other people in their lives. We 
could do a lot more on that front, I think. And you know, an another answer is that there are different organizations, folks like the Nurse Family Partnership and so forth, that actually try to go into these homes and get, go into these communities and try to give them knowledge that they don't have. Because a lot of these parents, they're not not reading because they think that it doesn't matter or because they don't love their children. They just don't know that, for example, if a kid knows 30,000 more vocabulary words when they start kindergarten, they're much more likely to have a successful life. So there are people that actually go into some of these communities and try to teach these parents, look, if you raise your voice, that can have really negative consequences for your kid's brain chemistry. If you read to your kid more, that can really promote the opportunities that they're going to have down the line. That's a very communitarian answer to this problem, but one that, from the evidence I've seen, actually looks like it might work pretty well. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so the power of check and balance will still continue in Trump's presidency, like the bureaucracy and uh, civil society, uh, even though uh, the Republican control both houses of the Congress. Um, but the staying power of the civil society's check and balance is still questionable. Uh, so the Women's March is amazing uh, from the media perspective, but um, if we compare it to the Tea Party movement, we see that it might have a long way to go because Tea Party movement, even though the form is questionable, uh, the, the content is questionable, but it has very widespread influence. And, um, um, and also we see that lots of times the civil society uh, check, uh, uh, the power can sometimes descend, in descend into violence. Uh, as you can see in the Berkeley. So what do you see that this, this kind of check and balance power from the civil society? Um, what kind of strategy it should uh, adopt in order to better exert its influence on the presidential power? Well, it's a tough question and pretty far outside of my, my area of expertise. But you know, m m my sense is that <coughs> The thing that's most powerful about civic society and some of these institutions, the fourth estate, the media, uh, you know, a, a lot, churches, a lot of these, these institutions that exist sort of in the middle layers of society, what's so important about them is that they have credibility, right? So that they're, they're, they're able to sort of channel certain passions and certain interests in a way that's, that's typically pretty productive. Now, I don't know that I would call the Berkeley protests and the, you know, the, the the, the anarchists who are setting cars on fire and so forth. I don't know that I would call them civic society, but one thing that came to mind when you were, you know, when you were talking about this is what's an institution in our society that still has incredibly broad support across the political spectrum? And one answer is the military. That's not what I'm thinking about. Another answer is science. Scientists have really, really high uh, rates of approval and rates of credibility even now in our society. So when I think of something like the science march, one thing that really worries me is that to the degree that we insert these things in this political conversation in a hyper-partisan way, we destroy the credibility of these institutions that are super important. And frankly, scientists marching on Washington are not going to do a whole lot to affect policy one way or the other. But what they may do is further the politicization of science that makes it harder for people to trust so-called scientific experts. So I really worry about that. And my, 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 my advice to those who are worried about civic institutions and civic society is to ask yourself, is the thing that you're doing building the credibility of this institution or is it destroying the credibility of this institution? And if it's not building the credibility of the institution, then it's not worthwhile because that's what we really need right now is civic institutions that people actually believe in. Thank you. Uh, a friend of mine was uh, at a Trump rally in uh, St. Joseph's County, South Bend, and uh, he commented that he was just so taken with the response. It was packed to the gills, and I think because Sanders was there the night before, and he had a fairly good crowd, but nothing like Trump. And, mm -hmm. and, and he commented that he knew then that there was something something in, in the works because uh, St. Joseph's County was deindustrialized like so much of the Midwest. And as you probably know, so many of the employees back in the 50s, 60s were uh, 
who are from Appalachia. In fact, I work with uh, Appalachians in the steel mills here in the southeast side sure. in Republic. And uh, they, the deindustrialization just devastated those communities in large measure, the Appalachians. In fact, one of our graduates at Washington High School, a kid named Wally, she wrote a book uh, about that. It was called Project Zero. I think she presented here. Maybe you guys might have remembered that. She's an anthropologist at MIT. But what this guy was commenting is that this jobs, jobs, jobs mantra, Trump's really resonated. And, and that's, if he can deliver, God love him. <laughs> now the skepticism, I'm sure, is all over this room right now. But uh, if he can somehow, maybe through education, get retrain these kids and get better secondary training in the vocational vocational education, maybe there's some hope in, in, with some new economic initiatives. And one final comment is, uh, you haven't really talked about your Marine Corps service. I served in the Army with a lot of Appalachians, and trust me, they were the best soldiers I had ever seen. Thank you. And what about the two generals Trump picked? Are you impressed? <laughs> They're both Marines. Yeah, well, I, I love both of the generals that Trump picked, especially General Mattis, who's sort of a folk hero for those who served in, in my generation of Marines. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I would be Trump's biggest fan if he's able to, to bring a lot of jobs back and do the things that are necessary to train folks for the next generation of American jobs so you know, that, that people could actually find dignified, stable work. Um, I, I would be incredibly happy. And it's definitely a message that resonates. And frankly, it's not just a message that resonates among those who voted for him. You know, one of the things that's so fascinating about the Trump argument is that you talk to a lot of working and middle-income Latinos, black Americans, folks who didn't vote for Trump because they just couldn't stand his rhetoric, but they loved that emphasis on jobs. And I've heard more positive remarks from communities that didn't vote for Trump, maybe they voted for Hillary or maybe they just stayed home, um, than, than I expected. And I, and I think it goes to show that there, there's a real frustration with the things, the way that things have been going for a long time in this country and whether it expresses itself in the way that folks switch their votes from Obama to Trump or just go from Obama voters in 2008 to not voting at all, it's, it's equally important and it could affect our politics over the long haul. Uh, there seems to be a lot of effort put forward by the left to sort of try and understand and vindicate the average Trump voter or the average middle American. Sure. But if you hear Trump talking about Chicago as, you know, full of carnage, there doesn't seem to be that same sort of effort among the right re reading the Wall Street Journal and the National Review and sources like that. Sure. So I was just wondering if you could speak to sort of that divide where the left seems to be trying to sort of reach across, but also in sort of a condescending way, and the right seems to be largely ignoring it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. And first of all, those on the left who are trying to understand the Trump voter, it's a really admirable thing, right, to, to try to take a group of people who, you, who didn't vote for you and to really understand what, what makes them tick, not just necessarily because you want them to vote for you next time, but because you, uh, you're actually concerned about them and worried about them. That's a really admirable trait. And frankly, I think that we've, we've really lost it, not just on the right, but increasingly folks on the left are less willing to play that game, right? They're less willing to play the compassionate game. And I think it speaks to the fact that our politics has become increasingly segregated and sort of bipolar. That worries me. My, you know, I, I've, I've written articles about why Republicans should be a lot more concerned about black Americans. There's this phrase that you hear, and it's relatively offensive if you run in Republican circles where folks will say, why aren't black, black people voting for Republicans? And the answer is, well, they're sort of addicted to all the entitlements, or a more offensive way of putting it is they're stuck on the Democratic plantation, which is language that I'm sure, if you pay attention to politics, you probably heard. And the thing that I always say is, look, guys, people are actually pretty good at voting for the things that they really care about, and they're not as stupid as you think they are. So the reason that a lot of these groups aren't voting Republican is probably because they don't think Republicans are offering them a whole lot. So maybe we should be having the same conversation and trying to show a little bit more empathy to those voters. I worry that there's just not that much space over the next couple of years for anybody to show empathy. So I think as opposed to seeing more of it on the right, my suspicion is we'll see just even less of it on the left. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mr. Vance. Thank you for writing the book. Uh, three quick comments. I also get frustrated by people that use big words. Uh, my <laughs> alcoholic grandmother, who has dementia now, I call her Dottie. I'm glad she never met your grandmother. 
Uh, and third, <laughs> I have never been more proud in my life than the time I first bought a meal for my little brother and sister. I give you a lot of respect for writing that down in a book. Uh, my question, you, you mentioned a lot about family, and this might get a little personal. Um, you, you talk about the fortitude of the family. A lot of families in these areas, um, mine in particular, they're, they're defined by trauma. I'm curious how you think about adding to your family and what things related to your upbringing, um, you know, different mechanisms that you had your grandmother there, um, what things might you do differently with your children? Have you, have you given that much thought? <laughs> Yeah, I think about that a, 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 a great deal. I mean, the thing that I want most of all in, in how I raise my own kids is that I, I don't want them to be afraid that when things are rough for one reason or another, if I'm upset for one reason or another, that the shit's going to hit the fan, excuse my language, right? So I, I worry especially, and I, I think of that as the, the enduring thing that I hated most about my childhood was just how chaotic it was that we were always walking on eggshells and we just never knew that you know a stepdad or a boyfriend could come home from work in a bad mood and it would be like a battle royale for the next four or five hours and so what I want most of all is to never or at least to as rarely as possible raise my voice to my kids and to just give them an environment where they feel stable they feel like they can always go home to that place one of the things that always really bothered me as a kid, I didn't write this down in the book, I don't think, is that I hated when people would send me mail because by the time they sent it to me very often, my address would have changed. And I want to have a sort of situation where if, a kid, if somebody sends my kid a letter, it's going to come to their home and they have some confidence in that. Thank you. Yeah. And that you'll run over your kid's best friend if need be, right? Like, <laughs> or I'll, I'll, I'll threaten. I'll threaten at least, yeah. right. We have time for just one more question. So. All right, so I really appreciate you coming to talk today because I come from kind of a similar background as you, low income, single parent family, in a rural community where you know, all the businesses, all the people are leaving, where heroin overdoses are just another thing you read about in the newspaper. Um, and I, while I do agree that there's reasons for so many of the poor working class people to vote for Trump, because for them it's a vote against this establishment and these, um, sure. just these failures of the government. But a lot of the narratives that I get from people when I go back home is also, like, they have this sense of blame for their problems, and they place that blame on marginalized communities, whether it's immigrants, whether it's this, like, idea of black folks being just, you know, welfare abusers. And a lot of times, like, I feel like that's that's also a huge, huge factor um, in their argument for Trump. And I'm wondering if you think that's something that existed before, if it's something that got a lot worse as um, Trump's rhetoric um, got more and more intense throughout the campaign. Um, and then also how I can have conversations with those people when I go back and try to explain to them that it's not the fault of those marginalized communities, that it's the fault of the government or this establishment of these macroeconomic policies? Sure. Well, in, in some ways, we're all a slave to our own experiences, right? So we see the things that we see, and that obviously informs how we interpret the world and how we understand some of these different phenomena. And I, I haven't seen nearly as much of what you're describing. I'm not saying you don't see it, but having not seen it as much myself, it doesn't inform as much of how I think about the Trump phenomenon. Obviously, you try to root these things in data so that you're not just speaking purely anecdotally. But, but at some level, the data is really open to interpretation in certain ways, right? And so it's, it's, it's sort of relatively easy to fit your biases or the things that you've seen into the data one form or another. So I, I, I think that clearly that's out there. And my worry with Trump and one of the co complaints that I raised during the campaign is that political rhetoric actually really matters. Right, the way that politicians talk about things actually manipulate the conversation. And so George W. Bush, right after September the 11th, reminded everyone that the gross majority, you know, 99.999% of our Muslim citizens were fantastic people and patriots and so forth, that the war on terror was not a war against Islam. And voters responded to that, Republicans and Democratic voters responded to that, right? Um, but when we start talking, having conversations, for example, about a Muslim ban, which thankfully President Trump retracted later on in the campaign, but as soon as he talked about a Muslim ban, all of a sudden a lot of voters actually supported the idea of a Muslim ban. 
I just don't think that's surprising because, again, people follow the rhetoric of their politicians. And so I did worry about that. I continue to worry about that. And that, to me, is a much big dri bigger driver than a sort of inherent, I really hate these marginalized groups who are sort of to blame for my problems in one way or the other. So the, the, the question about how, how to have a conversation with folks, I, I, I think that the way that I always try to frame this is to remind them that any of the problems that they're talking about that exist in some of these other communities also exist in our community. And that tends to break the ice a little bit, right? So you have a conversation about, well, you know, maybe, maybe people who don't look like us are taking too much in welfare benefits. It's, it's useful to remind people, well, hey, what about that guy down the street, right? Or what about all of these people that JD writes about in Hillbilly Elegy who are not other groups, they're just, you know, part of, part of the sort of white working class demographic. So there's utility, in other words, in finding commonality and pointing out that commonality and really identifying the ways that, that things have not been supremely, um, supremely good for some of these other groups of people too, right? The one thing I'll say, especially conversations about race, is that if you frame, if you frame criticisms of what have ha what's happened to minor minority groups in the United States in your conversations with maybe some, some white working class folks, if you frame it in terms that are accusatory, right? So if you talk about white privilege and talk about how they benefited from it even though they can't see it or they don't notice it, if you talk about that problem in an accusatory way or in an abstract way, you're not gonna get anywhere, right? Whether it's true or false, you're just not gonna get anywhere. But where I've had a lot of, a lot of luck in talking to people, let's say about, you know, why are black Americans living in these terrible ghettos? Why don't they just get out? Why don't they do something else? actually talking about how housing policy was really, really bad to those communities, and that's one of the reasons that they're trapped in these ghettos, that's a really powerful argument, and that's something I've never heard people push back against, right? So I, I just think my, 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 my argument, in other words, is point out the similar, similarities and have specific examples about people and the way that they're affected by some of these things. Don't make it abstract and don't make it about all of the things people who can't see their privilege have done wrong in their lives. Right. JD, I want to thank you so much for being here. I, I've, if you, you know, somebody asked earlier about sort of how you sort of bridge the divide, and I think one of the beauties about uh, JD's book, Hillbilly Elegy, is it does just that. I mean, it's the, it's the power of, of storytelling, which is that it brings us places we otherwise might not go and introduce, introduces us to people we might not meet, and I think you do it again with this in incredible honesty um, and also with this tenderness and a sense that you're still grappling with questions about your own life and about all these issues. And, and so I just, uh, I mean, I deeply admire you for, for that. And I'd urge you, if you haven't, you ought to really read this book. And I hope you keep on writing you. whatever else you let, do. Let me uh, you. just add, Alex, uh, because you won't, that uh, you, you, you've performed the same service uh, in the books that you've written. Absolutely. And uh, it, it's really a pleasure to hear the two of you in dialogue because you represent something really important. We, have, we live in times in which uh, reasonableness, thoughtfulness, the willing to hear one another, the willing to contemplate the notion that maybe um, uh, things aren't as we suspected uh, is, is, really, um, is really damaging. And so we are so grateful to the two of you for um, engaging in this conversation. And, and let me just say this. It not only gives me hope that there are people like Alex Kotlowitz and J.D. Vance around and um, offering uh, some guidance through their storytelling that might draw us together, but I just want to say how proud I am of the questions that were asked today and how encouraging it is to see um, thoughtfulness on the part of all the young people who ask questions today because ultimately that's the greatest hope uh, for us and that's really why the Institute of Politics exists to create this kind of environment uh, for uh, you to ask those questions. So congratulations to all of you and thank you so much for being here today.